Yeah. Got it? Got it? Okay. Praise God. Well, Father, we just come before you this morning, and we're just thankful for a wonderful, blessed time of worship this morning, Lord, and just for an opportunity to go before you in prayer, and Lord, we just thank you even uh, this morning for now, maybe the best part of the day, when we're in your word, and you're speaking to us, and you're showing us things, and you're teaching us how to live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we enter in, we enter in with joy. We enter in with thanksgiving. We enter in with excitement in what you're going to do in our hearts and in our lives through the study of your word. We ask you to wash us and cleanse us as your word tells us you will. Change us, conform us to the image of Christ through the words of this scripture. And we thank you for it today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I came across this little slide, which I had to read a couple times there. Because the way it's worded is kind of interesting. Caution, slow, slow men at work. And it made me think about uh, a story that I'd heard. It was about a guy named Joe. And Joe was a government employee. He worked for the Department of Transportation. And Joe was a dedicated employee. In fact, one time he woke up in the morning and he was sick. And he knew he was sick. His throat was very sore to the point where he had laryngitis. But see, Joe, he was a steadfast government employee. He went to work anyway. Well, when his boss realized that Joe was sick, he really felt bad for him. And they were going to do a, a street opening and a lot of digging and all that. And he said, Joe, I, I appreciate you coming to work today, but I'm not going to have you do the hard labor. I'm not going to give you a shovel. He says, I'm going to make you a flag man. He says, I'm going to give you a flag, set up some cones, and just warn the people that, that there's construction up ahead here. And Joe said, OK. I can do that. So he gave him the cones and stuff, and Joe went down and set up a line, as you saw probably outside of our church, where they were doing some construction on the water line there. And he went down to the end with his flag, and the first car came up, and Joe kind of flagged him over, and, and he signaled to the guy, and the guy rolled down his window, and Joe said, I just want you to know there's a government work crew up there. And the guy said, Oh, okay. I totally understand. I'll try not to wake them up. <laughs> now, you see, we enjoy jokes like that because there's a thing in us that, that finds it humorous to joke about the government, to joke about the authority over us. There was a famous humorist, Will Rogers, and he made a joke. He said that the Congress of the United States was about as useless as a baby with a hammer. <laughs> and you hear these late night talk show hosts and they're always kidding around about the government or the Congress or the president. And I think it's okay for us to have a sense of humor. I think God gave us a sense of humor. But here as we continue on in the second chapter of Peter's first letter, Peter's going to tell us that God wants us to have a positive and respectful attitude towards those who govern us. So he starts here in verse 13, continuing on from last week, and he says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise who do, of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Peter says two things here that seem contradictory. He says, act as free men, but submit to authority. Well, how do we make sense of that? Well, I read one commentary that said this, submission does not mean a denial of Christian freedom. Submission is the act of God's truly free people. I submit because I am free to submit. I submit because I choose to submit. 
Now, there are two significant things that Peter is saying here that I want you to focus on. One is this. This isn't Peter's opinion. Peter's being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this on behalf of God. And the reason why we can be certain of that is because it's almost identical to what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write in Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let's compare. Paul writes this. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them. Tax to whom tax is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. The second thing I want you to recognize about what Peter is saying here is this. He isn't saying that we're supposed to just submit to good leadership or to nice leadership. You have to remember that at the time Peter is writing this, the emperor of Rome, who is the ultimate authority over all the people, is a man named Nero. And Nero was persecuting Christians. He was burning them at the stake, and he was throwing them to the lions. But between what Peter has said and what Paul wrote in Romans, as we just read, and what Jesus said in Matthew 22, 21, where he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. I think we can conclude very safely that the Bible is teaching us that we are to submit to government authority as believers in Jesus Christ, as long as... It doesn't require us to violate the laws of God. Now, we see an example of this in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, Peter and John are now standing in front of the governing authorities over them. They're standing in front of the Jewish Sanhedrin. And it says this, And when they had summoned them, when the authorities brought them in, they commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. So they leave there, and they go out, and they do exactly what they said they were going to do. They continue to preach. So now the Sanhedrin brings them back in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 29. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Now, keep in mind that what Peter is saying in these verses we've been studying is that other than those limited examples where the person who you are under their authority is specifically telling you to disobey God, other than that... You're to obey and to submit to the authorities over you. I was thinking about this because I worked in a public school system for 25 years. I had all kinds of authorities over me, superintendent schools and principals and this and that and the other people. In 25 years of working for a school system, I can only think of one time that this applied. 
and it, and it had to do with a very simple thing. In, in most elementary schools, uh, they pick a student every morning, sometimes in each individual class, but in our school and in many schools, they would pick a student and bring them down to the office and they would give them the microphone and everybody in every classroom would stand up and that child would recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And on this particular day, I was sitting in my office and the, you could hear the intercom come on and said, please rise and all the kids, you could hear all the desks shuffle in the rooms. And I heard the pledge go and it went like this, uh, indivisible uh, uh, with liberty and justice for all. And I said, wait a minute, they, they didn't say under God. So my office was right down from the main office, so I got up out of my desk and I went around and the, the child was coming out of the main office. And I said, hey, listen, I, I just want to point something out to you. You know, you, you said the pledge wrong this morning. She said, what do you mean? I said, you left out under God. She said, the secretary told me to leave it out. So I went into the office and there was a little card that the kids used to read it off of. You think they would know it by heart, but you know, you're nervous when you had the mic in your hands. So they had it written right there for the kids. And those two words had a, a cross out through them. And I said to the secretary, what, what's going on here? She said, well, you know, it's a public school and we don't want a, a, a separation of church and state. I said, that's the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America passed by the United States Congress. <laughs> Amen. So I turned around and her desk was here and the principal's office was there. And I turned around and went to the principal's office and said, I'm going to tell you right now, you and me are going to have a problem if that's going to stay that way. Amen. I will not tolerate that. Amen. That's the only time in 25 years. Other than that, you know what I had to do every day? Go and do my job. Submit to the authority. I worked for nice bosses. It was, it was easy. But, but there were times when they would ask me to do things that wasn't necessarily what I wanted. But you know what Peter says? Just do it. That's your role as a Christian. And so Peter goes on here and he's, he's saying this. Listen, there's a reason. Uh, let, me, let me explain you something. There's a reason why God has to emphasize this. There's a reason why Peter emphasizes it and Paul emphasizes it. Because the old nature, that sin nature that we were born with, rebels against authority. Proverbs 17.11 says, a rebellious man seeks only evil. Well, guess what? That's what we were. Rebellious, bucking authority, don't want anybody to tell us how to act, don't want anybody telling us how to live. We want to be our own boss. And, and the Bible is trying to teach us that in order to curb that rebellious nature, we have to submit. We don't like it, but we have to. Because that's how we get changed from the old nature to the new nature. The new nature is a free man, the Bible says. But he chooses to submit to authority to curb his rebellious heart. And see, so Peter goes on now, just like Paul did in Ephesians. We saw it in Ephesians. We saw it again in Colossians. And he addresses the relationship between what he calls servants and masters. We would probably use the terms bosses or employees now. But look what he says. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. If for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. Now notice again, Peter's being very specific here. He's saying, I'm not telling you that this requirement to submit to authority only applies if your boss is good and gentle. <laughs> hey Paul, do you mind doing this for me? Oh, all right boss, yes, nice, I'll do it. No. He says, even if they're unreasonable, even if you come into work and they start yelling at you for something you didn't do, we're giving you more work than you did the day before. Well, I, I, that's not right. But he says if you bear up under that, if you have a godly attitude and you submit to that harsh and unjust treatment, he says it finds favor with God. Whew. That'll bring you a little comfort on a bad work day. Right? When the boss is rah, 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 just say, God, I thank you for your favor today. <laughs> Now, what is it about suffering 
unjust treatment that would cause us to find favor in God's eyes. Well, Peter's going to address it very directly here in verses 21 to 25. He says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Listen, you've got to connect the dots here. The first thing that Paul says in verse 21 is, you have been called for this purpose. What purpose? What was he just talking about? Suffering! Ooh. <laughs> That's the purpose. You've been called to suffer. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Not to suffer for doing evil. He says, what good is there for that? Of course you're going to suffer if you do evil. He says, you've been called as a follower of Jesus Christ to suffer for doing good. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy that part of the Christian calling that he had experienced, 2 Timothy 3, 11 and 12, he says, persecutions and suffering such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Now, pay attention to verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Hey, you can read that backwards because you can say this. Well, I'm not being persecuted. Well, maybe it's because you don't desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. Because he says, if you do, if you've made a choice to change your life so radically and so drastically that you're different from the people around you, they will notice you and they won't like it. Amen. Amen. So if we're not being persecuted, maybe it's because we look like everybody else and they can't figure out that you're a Christian. In John 15, 18 to 20, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.5, For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. And then he goes on in chapter 4 in that same letter, verses 8 through 11. He describes what has the Christian life been like for him and those around him who are following Christ. He says this. Here's a good description. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. Paul calls all of this in Philippians 3.20 the fellowship of his sufferings. See, when he's talking about death, sometimes death is the simple thing of just being mistreated. So, so, so a little bit of dying, you know what I mean? A little bit of being put down, a little bit of being criticized unjustly. He says all that death, what has to die in that? The self, the flesh, the ego. He says you let a little bit of yourself die in those situations, guess what will come to life? 
Christ. He says, Jesus suffered even though he committed no sins at all. And he said, this, this suffering that he went through without attacking back, that's your example to follow. And then in verse 24, he says, but he was more than an example. He was the sin bearer. He took our sins. He was the sacrifice. He suffered the penalty and the curse of sin for us. He accepted all the punishment for our sins and provided instead forgiveness and freedom. And these last few words in verse 24 and the first few words of 25 have a key word in them. Listen, it says, for by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually straying like sheep. That word for is significant because what he's saying here is the first phrase says this, the results of Christ's sacrifice are that you've been healed. Now, Damien mentioned last week that when you look at the words the Bible uses, they oftentimes have deeper meanings than simple English. When this word says you've been healed, here's what it really means. You've been made whole. You've been forgiven. You've been restored. You've been totally, radically changed by God because of what Christ did for you. But the second phrase reveals why it had to happen, why Christ had to be sacrificed for us. It says because we were constantly straying from God and rejecting him as our shepherd. Why? Because we were rebellious. That old nature that doesn't want authority. Listen, when we reject authority, this is what Peter's saying, you're just rejecting God. And that's, that's what the old nature always has done. And one of the most powerful Old Testament prophecies about the coming of Jesus, about the Messiah who would come, is from Isaiah 53, 6, which says this, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. See, that's the reality of the fallen world. Nobody wants God. You didn't want God. I didn't want God. You know what we want? We want to be God. That's why New Age religions have so much pull. That's why people are drawn to New Age religions. Because the New Age religions say, you can be God. And that appeals to the rebellious heart. But see, we were on a path it says we each had turned to our own way. You know, Eric's way. I'm gonna walk Eric's way. You know, Steve's way is my way. I do nothing my way. Nobody would tell me how to do nothing. And all of our ways were wrong. Amen. And all of us were walking on a path of destruction. And Jesus came and rescued us. And he restored us. And he inspired us. And ultimately, he's calling us to serve him. But what Peter is saying here is simply this. If that's where you're at, if you're ready to serve him, then understand one thing. Serving involves suffering. Yes. Yes. If you don't get that, then don't say, I'm ready to serve. And the perspective we need to understand is simply this. The reason why Jesus suffered is the same reason we will suffer. Jesus suffered because of sin. We will suffer because of sin. Now, I'm not saying our own sin because Peter says there's no value in that. There's no honor in that. There's no glory for God when you sin and you suffer for it. But when you suffer for somebody else's sin, then you are participating in the sufferings of Christ. That's why Peter says you go into work, and your unsaved boss makes you suffer. And you bear up under it with Christ-like love. You get favor. God gets glory. And maybe your boss one day says, you know, I'm kind of nasty to you and you still work hard for me and smile. Tell me about yourself. And you tell him about the God that you serve and God's son who died that made all the difference in your life. 
If we're going to reach the unsaved world, if we're going to reach the sheep that are still wandering, like we all were wandering, but they're out there wandering. They have not found Christ yet. He's looking for them. The good shepherd's going to look to bring them back. But you're his servant, and he tells you to go get that sheep. Pastor Roger, I know you raise sheep. And you tell me if I'm wrong about this. Sheep are not just gentle creatures. They bite. Am I correct? Have you ever been bitten by one of your sheep? Been hit. They'll butt you too. That's exactly right. And Damien made a point last week which was really significant. He says, don't be surprised how the unsaved are. They don't get it. They don't get it. And they don't get it that you're trying to bring Christ to them to save them from hell. They think you're trying to take away the way they want to live. They don't want to be under God's authority. They don't want to be rescued. And so you try to rescue those sheep, they will bite you and they will butt you. And you have to be willing to take a little bit of that suffering. Hey, I'm going to ask Sean Morrissey to come up here and uh, join me. I know, Sean, you're around here somewhere. Where are you hiding? I'm pretty sure he's here. I'm hoping he's here. Sean Morrissey. Sean, Sean, Sean. Here he comes. <laughs> you scaring me, buddy. <laughs> hey, we've been working on this song. The song's called I Want to Live Like That. It talks about, you know, leaving a, an imprint on this world because we reached out to the lost and we were willing to be Christ to them. Even if it cost us something. I think what will people say of me when I'm only just a memory when I'm home where my soul belongs was I love when no one else would show up was I Jesus to the least of those was my worship more than just a song to live like that give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you if love is who I am then this is where I'll stand recklessly abandoned never holding back to live like that I want to live like that Am I proof that you are who you say you are that grace can really change a heart do I live like your love is true People pass, and even if they don't know my name, is there evidence that I've been changed? When they see me, do they see you? I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, and this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that.
I want to show the world the love you gave for me. I'm longing for the world to know the glory of the King. I want to live like that and give it all I have so that everything I say and do points to you. If love is who I am, this is where I'll stand. Recklessly abandoned, never holding back. I want to live like that. I want to live like that. Live like that. This is a clarion call. The Lord has been building to this. He wants our hearts. He wants us to live for Him. He wants us to be set apart. We as a body have desired His presence. We have desired His Spirit to burn us. We have desired to be holy. Say yes. Today, say yes. Say yes that I want to suffer for Christ. Say yes that I am going to give up the comforts so that the name and the glory and the loss shall come and that the glory shall go to Christ and God. God has been building for this. The time is near. Liz has shared that they want to bring in the lost. For what? So that they can come to know who Christ is. And it is in, it's a decision within our hearts that we say, I am willing, Lord. I am yours. I submit myself. Are you willing? Are you willing? That's what it is. It's a call. And we must say yes. And then God will release what he wants to release. And our lives will be changed for the good. And also for, for suffering. And in that suffering, we will be made whole. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you today. We thank you that in your word today, you have issued a call. A call to follow you to the cross. And we know the way of the cross is a way of suffering. But Jesus didn't despise the suffering, but for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And let us not despise the suffering that is included in the Christian walk, but to say, so be it, Father. If they hate me because they hated Jesus, so be it. If I have to be persecuted in order to show people the difference you've made in my life by how I respond to their persecution, so be it. I'm yours. I'm your servant. Do with me as you will for your purposes, for your glory, for your name's sake. Thank you for this today in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>